humiliation. Like, I need to know why I'm humiliating myself to this being. If I want to truly worship him, then I think need to know why I'm humiliating myself in the first place, understanding the prerequisites. And now if we understand why, we have now gotten one step closer to understanding the words of the Imam Hopefully we can leave why we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for another day, inshallah, for time constraints. Sallallahu alayhi wa wa alayhi Muhammad. And thereafter, we move on. He says, this is what he says. He says, فَإِذَا فَعَلْتَ ذَلِكَ If you worshipped God and understood that there is nothing that is with Him, بِإِخْلَاصِ with sincerity. جَعَلَ لَكَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ أَنْ يَكْفِيكَ أَمْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرِ He has made it incumbent upon himself that you don't have any worry for this world and the hereafter. In other words, he will give you what you deserve in this world and paradise in the hereafter. He says if you do that with sincerity. Here, he says if you just have this sincerity, the lowest level of sincerity, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory on himself to give you Jannah. That's what he's saying. It's like, number one, number one, why didn't he say that you will deserve Jannah? Why did he say God will make it obligatory on himself to give you Jannah? What's the difference between the two? If God said he will make it obligatory on himself to give you Jannah, it's much, much different than saying you deserve Jannah. Why? Because the person who deserves Jannah is not the person who just worships God. Why? Because for me to reward someone for doing something, they don't have to do what is obligatory on them to do. Rather, they have to do something extra. In other words, in other words, the idea of you following the rules does not mean that you deserve a reward. Following the rules is something that is an obligation on you. For example, does the government give you money for raising your kids? No. Does the government give you money for abiding by traffic laws? No. They, you don't have that right on them. Because these rules are obligatory on me and you to follow. You are not rewarded for something that is an obligation that you have to fulfill. Rather, for doing something extra over that obligation, you are to be rewarded. For doing something extra, you are rewarded, not for the obligation itself. In other words, if God did not create heaven and hell, that does not take away the fact that you must and we must worship Him out of thanks for what He has given us. For all the blessings that He has given. If He didn't give us benefit, I mean the, the ultimate benefit which is paradise, or the ultimate harm which is hell, there's no need to, there's no, there's nothing to say that we don't have to worship Him. Rather, the obligation is still on us. And these are the words of Imam Ali. He said, if God did not create heaven, did not create hell, it is still an obligation on the people to worship God out of thanks for what He has given them. That's why he said, that's why he said, if you worship Him with sincerity, He has made it obligatory on Himself to give you heaven because He gave a lot. He gave a promise that He would, but it's not an obligation that He has on that He has that He has for you, or it's not something that you actually innately deserve. It's a mercy. He says, sincerity. You have to worship him with sincerity. That is the lowest degree of sincerity. What's the lowest degree of sincerity? The lowest degree of sincerity is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah, not for the slave, not for someone to see me, not for someone to hear my beautiful voice. That is the lowest level of sincerity. But the higher levels of sincerity are much, much, much more than that. In the hadith, Amir al-Mu'mineen says this. He says, the worshipper of th are of three types. This last hadith and we'll go into the majlis. The worshipper are of three types. The first one is the one who worships Allah out of fear of hell. And that is the worship of the slaves. The second is the one who worships God out of love for paradise. And that is the worship of the <laughs> businessman. Give me paradise and I will worship. It's a business transaction. And there's a third. And then there are those who worship Allah out of thankfulness and another hadith out of love. And that is the worship of the free man. 
the one that has utmost sincerity. Mashallah. Utmost sincerity. But if you want to give God just his right, then give him the lowest levels of sincerity. Look at the mercy of God. He's not asking for the highest levels. He says, the lowest levels of sincerity, give it to me. And I will give you what you don't deserve in that is paradise. How merciful is this Lord? All of this in the treaties of rights, my brothers and sisters. Go read the treaties of rights. And you'll see how beautiful that treaty is. Salah Muhammad. Allah, Muhammad, Muhammad, Now, this is what the Imam السلام, gave this religion. As for his khutbah, we'll leave it till tomorrow, inshallah, we'll analyze it. But this is what the Imam السلام, gave for this religion. But subhanAllah, this very Imam that was pressured, that was oppressed, that had the worst things done to him, if we were to go back, just weeks after Abu Abdullah al Hussein was killed, we would see him in Kufa. And we would see his hands chained to his neck. And we would see him trying to lift the chain from his neck. And when he finally does, it is said the blood gushed down from the neck of Imam Zayn al Abidin. SubhanAllah, how the Imam's fates were similar. We cry for the chain that was on the neck of this Imam. We cry for what the Imam السلام, had to go through, the back of the Imam that was bent because of the chains and the heaviness. But what about the back of Aba Abdullah al Hussein? What about the chest of Aba Abdullah al Hussein? If we cry for the chains that was around the chain that was around the neck of Imam Zain al Habidin, he at least had a neck for the chain to go around. <laughs> Abu Abdullah al Hussein's neck was severed. If we cry for the back of Imam Zain al Habidin that was hunched over because of the chains and the weight of the chains, then what are we to say about the back of Abu Abdullah al Hussein? that was trampled by the horses. Allahu Akbar. See, a lot of us know what happened when Shimon ibn al Jawshan came down and killed Abu Abdullah al Hussein. But many of us don't know what happened after Abu Abdullah al Hussein was killed. The narration says, after the Imam's martyrdom, the enemies came to rob the Imam from his clothing and possessions. They robbed the Imam's shirt, his turban, his sandals, and the Imam was wearing clothes, and even those were taken. Ya Imam, Ya Abba Abdullah. The only thing left was a bit of clothing on the Imam. A man wanted to take the Imam's waistband, because it was an expensive waistband after the people took everything else from the Imam. The man says, I wanted to take off the waistband, but when I came near the waistband, he placed his right hand on the waistband. I wasn't able to remove the hand, so I severed the right hand of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. I went for the waistband once again. He placed his left hand on the waistband. So I lifted, and I couldn't lift it. So I severed the left hand of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. It wasn't only an Abbas who had his hand severed on the day of Ashura. Abba Abdullah al Hussein also had his hand severed. Wa 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 Abba Abdullah. He says, I wanted to loot the pants of the Imam. But then I heard the sound of an earthquake. The sound scared me, therefore I stopped. And from that shaking, I fell unconscious. The Imam says, the man says, as I was unconscious, I saw the Prophet Ali bin Abi Talib, Fatima al-Hassan. 
Fatima was saying, Oh, my son, they killed you. May Allah punish them for what they done. So Abu Abdullah in the vision replied, Oh, my mother, this man that is sleeping, cut my hands. So she supplicated against me, saying, May Allah cut your hands and legs and make you blind and put you in hell fire. The man says, After some time, I lost my vision, my hands and my legs, and the only thing left for from her supplication was the fire. After the death of the Imam, the world darkened for three days. The light of the sun didn't show for three days. The people could see the stars during midday colliding with each other. <laughs> Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. It is sent through the night. The women and children slept, but during the night they can hear sounds. It is said after the death of Abba Abdullah. After the death of Abba Abdullah, when the sun was going down, there were special sounds that were being heard in Karbala. <laughs> Apart from all of the other sounds they were hearing at night. What were those sounds? It was the sounds of the horses pounding the purified body of Abba Abdullah in the Hussein. It is said the cracking of Abba Abdullah in the Hussein's ribs were being heard ringing through the lands of Karbala. Hearing these rings, Sayyidah Zainab screams, Ya Muhammad, Salah alayka Malik al-Sama. Oh Muhammad, may the king of the sky send his blessings on you. Hada Husaynu Muramadu on Biddima Mukatta wa Aba Maslum al Aba Rahmati wa Rida. This is Hussein covered with blood and sand. His limbs are cut into pieces and his turban is in his robe, all covered with sand. وبناتك سبايا إلى الله المشتكى وإلى محمد المصطفى وإلى علي المرتضى وإلى فاطمة الزهراء and your daughters are captives and we complain to Allah to Muhammad to Ali and to فاطمة الله أكبر فاطمة دار حسين narrates she says I was standing by the tent's entrance while looking at my father and his companions slaughtered on the land of Karbala and I heard and saw the horses pounding their bodies she says I hear the Ruaya says that the sound of Umar ibn Sa'd's voice can be heard who will volunteer to pound the chest of Husayn with their horses ten people volunteer to pound the, the chest of Abba Abdullah <laughs> Allahumma 
Hassan together. Salatuka alayhi wa ala